Uh, we started last week a series, and I don't know if I want to call it a series because each, each message stands on its own, um, but the emphasis is on contentment. And uh, the question, and if you didn't get, if you didn't watch last week, you want to watch it because it's a major piece. Um, why I'm choosing this topic of um, contentment. You understand why I'm going in the direction that I am here on Thursday nights. But I asked the question last Thursday that if nothing ever changes, and again, this is just um, hypothetical, but if nothing ever changes in your life from this point on, no more bad and no more good. Nothing. It just maintains. Can, can you be content? I could even ask this question. Um, of course, I don't have to say, hey, if you win the lottery and everything starts going great and more good things happen than bad things happen, you're going to be content. That's a given. However, on the, other, on the other end, what if more bad things happen than good things and you just get hit one? And sometimes that's a season. We go through one hit after another hit, and you're like, oh, my God, what? Can, can, can anything else happen? Don't, don't say that because obviously more bad can happen. But, but even then, can you, the question is, can you be content? So the Apostle Paul opened, um, really opened up something here to us. We call it the secret of contentment because that's what he calls it. But tonight we're looking at apprehending, being apprehended. So um, the first verse that we're pulling off of for the secret of contentment. Paul found this secret, and I want to, we want to try to get into that and get it for ourselves because if you think about it, if you're looking for life to treat you in a way that you'll be content, it, that's not going to happen. It took me years in my stupidity um, that I thought, boy, if I just start doing the right things, things will start lining up right. And, that's what they kind of make it sound like. Or get saved and, you know, everything goes great for you. And that's not the case. So Paul was probably one of the most persecuted um, apostles. And he says, I've found the secret of contentment. And it's not in materialism. It's not in fame and fortune. It's not in popularity. It's not in anything you think I got the... I got the best job, I got the best family, I got the best husband, I got the best... No, that's not going to bring contentment. It's not. Um, it, it's a blessing, they're, they're blessing, but it's not going to bring contentment. Now look at what he says here um, in Philippians chapter 4. He says, not that I am implying that I... And this is the Amplified, I believe. Not that I am implying that I was in any personal want, for I have learned how to be content satisfied to the point where I am not disturbed or disquieted. He says, I've come to the point where I am not disturbed or disquieted. In whatever state I am, whatever state I am, this is the secret, whatever state I am, okay, I know how to be abased and live humbly and straighten circumstances, and I know also how to enjoy plenty and live in abundance. I have learned in any and all circumstances, I'm going to repeat that again, I have learned in any and all circumstances the secret of facing every situation. Okay? Whether well fed or going hungry, having a sufficiency and enough to spare, or going without and being in one. So this is the verse, and this is the amplified version that um, we're pulling off of tonight. But Paul says, I found the secret of contentment. And if we can get there, if our eyes can be opened, when I say get there, it's not by effort, it's a, by revelation. And um, we'll talk more about that in the weeks to come. This may go a little further than what I thought, because um, I believe, and let me just back up, Sunday mornings, for several weeks now, I don't know, months, months, we've been talking about dominion. And we transition, we're still dominion because you take dominion by promises. And that's what we're talking about on, um, on Sunday morning is that God gave Abraham promise. We are children, heirs according to the promise. So we live by promise, which is grace. Things God has freely raised us for, inheritance and given us. And we live by that. Abraham lived by promise. And he was able to take the land. 
Um, Joshua was able to take the land because it was promised to Abraham, and they were able to take it. It's based on promise. And so we take dominion through the promises of God. Dominion over your, over your um, health, dominion over your mental health, dominion over deliverance of any type of addiction or stronghold or anything like that. We take um, dominion through what Christ did on the cross, promise. Okay? And so we've been talking about dominion. Now there's a reason for that. Now what we're going to do in probably finishing this year out is talk about this subject because I really believe that there's a lot of crazy out there happening, whether it's in education, whether it's in the medical, whether it's in our government, there's a lot of crazy going on. There's crazy going on in the Middle East and um, recession, depression, whatever you want to call maybe coming. We're spending more money today than we ever have on, on things that are the necessity. And as I asked you last week, are you, are you more well off today than you were a year ago, two years ago, five years ago? And so it may get rough in the weeks to come. It may get really, I don't know. I don't know. But we're in this world. So whatever crazy does affects us. Though we're not of the world, we're in it. But we're of the kingdom. So we, get the, we, we take the hits being in this world, but we look to the kingdom to get us through the hits we take. Because God is faithful not to leave us and see us through whatever economy, whatever crap goes, comes down the pike. He is faithful to see us through because he's faithful. And um, so, but we're going to have to learn in hard times two things. Know how to take dominion, and then when things don't turn out the way you want them, be content because all kinds of bad mistakes, um, wrong decisions, taking the wrong path can come if we're not content because we're being driven by something that we want contentment and we think it's this, this, that, or the other, and these are the things we'll go after and it's not what God is doing. And I really believe that my, what I feel responsible for, I've got, to, I've got to be held accountable to God as a pastor, teacher, is that I prepare the people for <clears throat> life. The good, the bad, and the ugly. And if, I, if what I'm teaching is not grounding you in Christ and getting you prepared for whatever's coming, good, bad, or ugly, you got I mean... Are we, are we teaching that you know how to live in plenty? Have you ever? We want the plenty, but we don't want to know how to live in it. Right? What? Well, I get plenty. I spend it all on me, the family. Is that living in plenty? Is that is that learning how to? Um, yeah, we'll just get more plenty, and and so we're not being good stewards of the money. So anyway. I really feel like we've got to be prepared. And if and if good is coming, okay, we haven't lost anything. We still we we still taken dominion in the good times. We're still being content in the good times. We're not content because of the materialism and the good, but content no matter what. Does that make sense? And so, in other words, if we get to this place by revelation, like, like Paul, none of these things move me. Whether I'm in prosperity, that doesn't move me. Whether I'm in want, that doesn't move me doesn't matter what's going on in the world. I'm, I'm taking my cues and my sources from the kingdom of God being in this world. Okay. So anyway, um, maybe that might help you where I, where, I, where I want to take it. The world today is not content. Sad thing is, neither is the church. And there's a reason why there's, a, there's no, no contentment today. Paul says, I found the secret to contentment. But is, does the church know that secret? Does the church, is the church content? So I'm, I'm, I'm sitting here and I'm thinking about this. And um, so I'm, I ask myself the question. Um, obviously the world's not content and they, they shouldn't be. They're in darkness. But they're like the prodigal son. He's not content in the farm. He takes it and squanders everything and riots his living, living in the pig pen. That, that is, that's a man who's not content, but he went after contentment and didn't get it. And so you have to ask the question, okay, so the, the world's in darkness. They're never going to get contentment. But what about the church? 
Are we the older brother at home? Do you think he's content? He's 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 got a beef with his dad that he you know it comes out when the when the when the prodigal comes home and is celebrated, that discontentment that's been there all along comes out and says, You've never given me a skinny goat, let alone a fattened calf. So he, he's not content. So if, if the church is the older brother and the world is the the sons who've not yet come into their identity, where Where's the, where, we got to find the secret to contentment. We, you know, there's got to be contentment on the farm, right? I mean, surely this, the father is good enough and provides in a way that he's enough for us and that we're content. How about this scripture? The Lord is my shepherd. Who wants to finish it? Why? Listen to that. The Lord is my shepherd, and he's such a good shepherd who knows what I have need of before I ask, who says, take no thought for your life, and says, look at the birds, look at the flowers. I mean, he's, and, and then you look that, you've, you, that this has all been pre, pre-arranged before the foundation of the world, all the days you've been written before the, before the first one. All those come into play, and you're like, what, what is it that I will be lacking? That's another translation. Lord is my shepherd, I shall not lack. What is, I'm not going to lack. I'm not going to be in want. He provides everything, and if you can make that statement, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, I think you've found the secret to contentment. We're driven by desires, we're driven by passions, and we're driven by wanting more and more, we work more, which we, we, dis- we discussed all that last week. Okay, anyway, so, um, so I'm asking the question, can't do nothing about the world, they're in darkness till they get light, but we are in light, so where's the secret, how, how, how do we get our eyes open to it? And who should be the one? Like I said, had somebody opened this up to me in my younger years, it would have greatly benefited me. Because I was zealous for all kinds of things. I was ambitious. I was, I mean, just driven, driven, and driven. And that's not the way to be. You get yourself in a lot of trouble and uh, being driven like that. And you take, the, you take the responsibility on yourself to make things happen. So I want to ask this question. If the church, would you agree that the church should know the secret to contentment? If anybody, it's the church. And if the church isn't content, and they're just as ambitious and driven as the world, and wanting more and more and more, but never getting enough to be satisfied, well, then what is the church preaching and teaching that we're not getting the contentment, the secret that Paul got. And so I just thought, okay, let me just sit back and I'm going to ask myself some questions. And um, first of all, before I go there, I want to ask the question, what should the church be preaching? Before I show you what they are preaching, what should they be preaching? So we'll look at that real quick. Then I'm going to show you what they are preaching and you tell me why we're in the place we're in that we don't know contentment. Okay, what's the next verse? Corinthians Mm -hmm. 2 2. Now, watch what Paul says. When he goes to any church, especially he's talking to the Corinthians, he says, I when I am among you, and I'm doing the speaking, he says, I determine not to know anything except Christ and Him crucified. So that means he's only going to preach the cross and Christ, the life of Christ and the sacrifice of Christ. I am not, because everything is in that. Everything is in that. He is not going to waste their time, his time, and teach on the extras, the add-ons, that end up just being human arguments that no one's going to agree on half the time anyway. And so he says, Christ in me is the hope of glory, and Christ is being unveiled in me, and there's where we stay. We don't venture off into anything else. Now watch this. Let me ask you a question. And I know, I hope this ain't a myth because I've said it a million times and I was thinking about Googling it and I kept forgetting to do it and I didn't do it. I think I'm right. I heard how the FBI studies counterfeit money because there's a lot of that going on. So they hire these guys to study counterfeit money because it's always changing. How do they study counterfeit money? They study the real thing. thing. And if you keep your focus on the real thing, 
everything else gets worked out without making it the primary thing. End times. Well, let's just, let, let, let me get to here. Colossians 1, 25, 27. So he says, I'm gonna, when I'm among you all, we're, gonna, we're just going to preach Jesus and the cross, the finished work, that Christ and the finished work. Then he says to the Colossians, of which I became a minister, this stewardship, I became a minister from God, which was given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, the mystery that's been hidden for ages and from generation but now has been revealed to you guys, us the saints, next. And what is this mystery? To them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Not mysteries. He says this is the mystery that's been hidden for ages, and we're going to fulfill that word. We're going to, we're going to unveil that word to you, Christ in you. So when he says, I'm preaching Christ in him crucified, he's unveiling the Christ that's in you, and he's not moving off of that. Because the minute you move off of that, it's no longer the, the standard, it's no longer the foundation, but everything's got to come to it. So Jesus goes to these two disciples on the road to Emmaus, and they don't know how to read the Old Testament. They don't even know what the Old Testament is. They did their best shot trying to understand the Old Testament, as the Pharisees did. They did their best in trying to understand. They're looking through a glass darkly as we are in the new. They did in the old. And they don't even know what these scriptures are about. But Jesus goes to them and begins to unveil to them him from the scriptures. Nothing else. Nothing else. He doesn't get into prosperity. He doesn't get into end times. He doesn't get into anything because you can make this Bible Say anything, and te you can teach almost any subject from this Bible, but, his, but the subject he taught them, and the only thing they really needed to know about, was him. So that's what's the church into today. I don't know where you, I don't know, you know, um, I used to always say, you know, if you, if you watch Christian television, and I got a lot of people who would come back and say, we don't watch it. And I guess I'm a glutton for punishment. I was the only one at the time watching it. Um, so again, I don't know what you watch. I really don't know what you watch. I don't know what, you, what you're tuning into on YouTube now. Um, the devices now are much, much more popular than cable TV. I don't know what you're watching. And I don't know what you see going on in other churches. But that's my business. That's my bread and butter. I, 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 I want to know and I, what's, the, what's the teachings out there. Are they valid? Are they not? Um, what, what, what fads going on out there are, what, what trends happening, uh, what, what move of the Spirit, what, what, what is the emphasis of the Holy Spirit? That's all my, that's what I do. And then I pass that kind of stuff on to you, or I keep you from stuff that shouldn't be passed on to you, right? So what is being taught today? Here's the big one, whether you know it or not, and you'll come across it one day if you haven't yet. It's called deconstruction. Everybody is deconstructing everything. That's the trend. That's the fad. Because it gets likes. It gets so let me let me explain something to you about politics. You've got the left. And I ain't getting political. I'm just going to show you how this stuff works. And you got the right. Then you've got what we call the moderates in the middle. Right? You hear that? What happens is we've got people on the right that go far right. Right? Mm -hmm. And we got people on the left that go far left. You can't stop there. That's where they always have you stop. That is the perspective that they want you to stop at. But do you understand if you follow the politics at all or culture, you, you know, watch the culture, there was a day that the far left didn't believe there were more than two genders. So the far left went farther. Huh? And then you've got the right that didn't believe in abortion and so far that they, in that they didn't believe in it um, that you get some of these crazies that will go bomb an abortion clinic or they just go way too far. What do you think happens if these people keep going this direction and these people keep going that direction? No compromise. Huh? No compromise. 
Well, yes, but what else? They meet in the middle. They will meet in the middle, and what these you go so far left, you'll become so far right. You become so far right, you'll meet these people somewhere over here. Because history shows this. Just, just, walk, just look at human history, and you'll see this happening. When I'm talking about deconstruction, you're going to deconstruction people out of the faith, and the Bible's not going to mean anything anymore. They, they're deconstructing the devil. They're deconstructing end times. They're deconstructing the atonement. They're deconstructing they deconstru to the point now where what 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 you just keep you keep deconstructing, and you're going to you're going to deconstruct people out of not going because I'm I'm seeing the I'm seeing people do it, and I'm seeing the responses. And it's going to here's where it's going to come to the place that that we're going to deconstruct this thing so much over and over and over again that here's where it comes down to. Here's where it's going to go. You keep going this way, you're, going to end, you're, you're thinking you're in the right camp, but keep, keep going, keep deconstructing, and you're going to be over here, which you thought you'd never be. Meaning this, well, if there, there isn't a hell, there isn't a devil, and I'm not debating these things. I'm not, it doesn't, to, to me, I, ha, I know where I land on these things, so I'm, not I'm just trying to show you something. Because I know that... Um, it doesn't matter what I believe. It matters what you believe, right? Um, but if, if, the, if, you, if, you can if you deconstruct the hell and deconstruct the no devil and deconstruct the Bible to where, you know, it's just there. I mean, you really can't. It's not really the word of God. I understand what they're saying. And that since it's not the word of God, how much crap clout do I give it? You talk me out of the promises. You talk me out of directives. You because uh, then, then what happens is, well... You know, you, you, you deconstruct the church, the ecclesia. I don't have to go to church. I don't you deconstruct giving, so I don't have to give. You can deconstruct where a universalism or the magic prayer. You can keep destructing that to where now anybody, any anyone, anywhere, through any ways and means. And it's like just keep keep destructing. Keep, go ahead and keep destructing the, all these things, and you're going to come over here. You may not, but there are people looking for excuses. To check out. Yeah. To completely check out of everything. I don't have to read the Bible. I don't have to go to church. I don't have to give. I don't have to, I don't, I don't got to do nothing. Hell, I'm, I, I love this teaching. That's not, what the, that's not what grace does. Grace causes you to give. Grace wants to read the Bible. Grace wants to gather with people. You give people an excuse not to do something, and you're going to get a group of people that will always gravitate to that. But what ends up happening is, they go so far, they're going to shipwreck their faith. They're not going to believe in anything. Nothing to believe in. We've just deconstructed God out of everything, and in the, in the, in the Bible out of it. Is this making sense? So I see this stuff. Everything I'm seeing, some, somebody's deconstructing something, and it doesn't bring contentment to me. It troubles me. I can't have a diet on deconstruction. Okay, so you got what's going on in the Middle East right now. I refuse to watch, and I'm not going to name the names on TV, but it's new moons, new blood moons, new everything, and they're going to do their thing again, and they're going to put fear in people, and here we go during the end times. And that's going to be a big thing now. They're going to milk you with money. They're going to come out with books. They're going to come out with new CDs on what's happening in the Middle East. I, I, I'm old enough and been saved long enough. I have seen it all the time. There was a guy that figured out that Mussolini was the Antichrist. And he wrote the book. And it's on the pu it was being published. It was on the printing press. Already bought in book form, in boxes, ready to be shipped out. This man proved Mussolini, World War II, was the Antichrist, who was the dictator from Italy. And as soon as they left the manufacturer, he was assassinated. And then you've got George Bush going over into Iraq, into Iraq because of what they did with Kuwait in 1990, Desert Storm. And then all of a sudden, John Woolward, I think that's from Dallas Theological Seminary, wrote a book on oil, Middle East, and something else. And you saw nothing happened. Hagee came here at the Red Barn and said thousands of 
body bags are being shipped. We're gonna, we're gonna, they're gonna, we're gonna be wiped out. All we got was friendly fire. Okay, and then David Wilkerson said all our troops are over there, so Russia's gonna parachute people down into here, and, and we're gonna be attacked. Didn't happen. See, you get crazy when you leave Christ and Him crucified. You get caught up in what the devil's doing in this world system and you're trying to figure out what the devil's doing rather than getting unveiled what Jesus has already done for you. Amen. And this is, this is what we got. This, that, that, this is the only thing that brings content. That out there is not going to bring contentment to you. You're probably troubled with what's going on. And rightly so. But I'm not going to try to figure that out. That's all evil going on over there. That ain't the kingdom of God. And if you're not going to get into deconstruction and end times you're in, in Israel, you're going to get into self-help. You're going to be all about self-help, secret steps and keys, how to make a better you. Good luck with that. That's why he ended you on the cross. Because he's not looking for a better you. He's looking for a new you. Legalism. It kind of goes along with that. The doctrines of men, politics in, politics in the pulpit. It's a me gospel. This does not bring contentment at all. It can't. It's not designed to. The church has gotten to a place, not all churches, I'm talking in general, has gotten to the place that they're building a kingdom. And I'm sitting here, I'm going to say something, and, you know, I haven't thought this through, so, but I think I'm, I'm, I'm on the right path. So let's say you have a church of 50 people, 30 people, 50 people. And it becomes a church of 500 people. Then it becomes a church of 1,000. I want to ask you a question. Who profits the most from a big church? I'm going to tell you there's only one person that profits from a big church. The pastor. You don't. Because if you're a worship leader of 30 people... And I'm now up to a thousand people, and I've got about three or four more worship leaders that's better than the one I have. Well, we got to give it to that one. They're, they're anointed. Man, they moved the crowd. Now you're out, and they're in. And then you've got people that now have got so many people, everybody's sitting on their gift because only so many people can fit on the stage. And the pastor used to come to the hospital to visit you when you had 30 people. Now with a thousand, he sends a deacon. You never see him. Or like some people, they send, a, they send the uh, iPad and he gets online from his office and talks to you through the iPad. Through somebody who took the iPad to the, to the, to the hospital. So, no, you, I thought this through. Um, now, you say, well, we, the bigger programs and the more outreach, we're reaching more people. More people you will never know their name and they'll never get the sub because the church is too big for you to even know who they are. So how, 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 does the, how do they get disciple? Jesus said go make disciples. He didn't say go just get people for the sake of getting people. And we're, getting, we're at the place where we're more about um, quantity than we are quality. I'm telling you right now, this, all this mega church stuff only benefits one guy. One guy. And so therefore he's always trying to raise money and and get volunteers because it's building his kingdom that benefits him and not you. And that's why the, the early church, the house churches, where there was 10, 20, 30. And they, they, they'll tell you that, man, when you get to 50, you're going to have to have help because if you get to 100, you've got to cap this thing or you're no longer intimately effective with the people in your congregation. That you're supposed to shepherd them. Listen to this. I may not even get to my message, but listen to this. Ezekiel. He says, Therefore, my shepherds, hear the sound of my, my um, hear the sound, hear the word of the Lord. As I live, declares the Lord God. Surely because my sheep have become a prey, they have become a prey, and my sheep have become food for all the wild beasts. Since they're, see, these people aren't being discipled and they're, they're being tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine and by every wolf in sheep's clothing and whatever the enemy's doing. He says, they're, they're praying to all the wild beasts. Since there was no one to shepherd them. And because my shepherds have not searched for my sheep, but the shepherds have fed themselves 
and have not fed my sheep. Who gets fed when the church gets bigger? Who doesn't get fed? It's a, it becomes a spectator. I'm, 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 the, I'm the talent and you're the, the fan base. All I'm saying is, you keep doing this, everything, and there's so much more I could get into, but I'm, I'm running out of time, um, that we, Paul says, I'm not going to get into the, any of that. If we study Christ, and he gets unveiled to us by the Spirit, and we come into who we are, all these things, you'll land somewhere, like I said, in these, but, but, they, but they're nothing. They're, sec, they're so secondary that I'm not giving them the time of day. They said to Jesus, when are you coming back? When are you going to restore the kingdom back to Israel? It ain't for you to know any of this. I mean, he would say, they would say, let's do this. You know, no, you follow me. You follow me. Well, let me go bury my dad. No, you follow me. Let me go get my, no, you follow me. There's so much stuff that in this world draws you to that we, that we um, get tempted with. Not, not so talk. Let me move on because this is, this is going somewhere, <coughs> believe it or not. So Paul was about knowing Christ and Christ living life as you through you to know the love of God. Jesus said the law and the prophets are summed up in what? Two commandments. Remember what they are? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your heart, mind, and soul, with all your strength. And what's the second one? He said that all the law and the prophets are summed up in these two commandments. Love God and love your neighbor as yourself. Now, um, we're, we're, we're praying about something. I don't know whether I'll do, do this or not. But I'm, I'm just, even if I don't do it, it's still worth mentioning. I have, I have taught through the Song of Solomon two separate times verse by verse years and years and years ago. But when I did that, I didn't have the understanding of oneness and union that I do today. So it changes the whole dynamic of that letter when that piece, when that veil gets lifted and you see that. But let me just tell you what happens with the first four chapters of the Song of Solomon. The first four, you get the, the first four, 416, is the bridal paradigm. If you, you, you remember, you, you remember me telling you this. The, the bridal par paradigm. Then you go to 4, 16 to 8, because there's eight chapters, you get to the bridal partnership. What is that? This first half is love the Lord your God. It's a love affair, and it's all about intimacy. You love the Lord your God with all your heart. The first commandment is the first four chapters. Then, then smack in the middle of four, the emphasis changes to partnership, and then you start loving your neighbor as yourself. You partner with him to love others and to minister to others. Does that make sense? So that's, that's really what, what church should be. Jesus said, I'm taking all the law, and I'm taking all the prophets, and I'm going to reduce them down to two things you're going to be able to remember what we're about. <clears throat> Isn't that easy? Love God and love others. But today, there's so many theologies out there, and so many doctrines of men out there, and so much divisiveness and debate in, in, in weaponizing doctrine, against each other. We've got 40,000 denominations, and we're not doing the two things the whole thing was summed up for us to be able to do. For God so loved the world, He's in love with us, and Jesus came as a sacrifice for those that He loved. So that's what it's all about. And when you move off of that, I have no interest anymore, because then I become discontent. I start becoming irritable when I see deconstruction. I start becoming irritable when all, all of a sudden it's not about Jesus, it's about Israel. I get, I, I get, I just don't, but man, when you give me, and there's people out there who'll do this, when you give me Jesus and you unveil him, and I get a revelation of him and me in him and what this whole thing's about, and he does a transforming work that launches me out there to do the work of the ministry called loving others as I'm loving him, these two dynamics are always working, loving him and loving others. Then you've found fulfillment. Then you've found contentment. You can't find contentment in selfishness and narcissism. It's not going to happen. 
Not, it's not going to be more money. It's not going to be more people in the church. It's not going to be more programs. It's not going to be any of that. Now, now, now here, that's, that's my introduction. Look at this verse here. Here's where we're going to go. Uh, yeah. That was a 40-minute introduction. You've got to be kidding me. Jeez. Okay. Philippians 3, 10, and 12. Now, this is the message. This is part two. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, if by any means I may, now watch, may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Now, here's verse 12. I just gave you 11 to put it in context. Here's what I want you to see. Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on. Now, here's what... That's good, but here's what I want you to see. That I may apprehend, the words apprehend, that I may apprehend that for which Christ Jesus has also apprehended me. There are two dynamics happening here. On the, let's just use Paul on the road to Damascus. So Paul's on the road, Saul, is on the road to, uh, to Damascus to persecute Christians. And Jesus intervenes and says, why are you persecuting me? Now, what happened Paul doesn't know this. Paul's on the road to Damascus, but if you could pause the story and say, what does Paul not know? That he was chosen before the foundation of the world in Christ. What else does he not know? Galatians 1, 15, 16, Christ is already in him being unveiled, and the Spirit's going to do that, and the Spirit is speaking through, the Spirit of Jesus is speaking to him, why are you persecuting me? He doesn't know any of this. He's the prodigal out there doing his thing, and he gets apprehended. But he got apprehended before the foundation of the world. Now, what, is the word, what does this word apprehend mean? It's not on your outline, because it's Greek, and I'll just tell you what it means. It means to seize, tight, hold up, arrest, catch, capture, appropriate, <coughs> um, overtake, comprehend, apprehend. Um, it means making it one's own. So what Paul's saying, there's two dynamics happening here. God made Paul his own before the foundation of the world. And in real time, he experiences that on the road to Damascus. Paul says, I've been apprehended by him. And it means that God knows everything about, he does, he created Paul. Remember we did the eulogy before the foundation of the world? He called your name. He identified you. He, he gave you the calling, your gifts, everything. The, all your days are written out. He is more intimate with you. Knows every, every, every number of your head. I mean, hair on your head. Um, he know, I mean, God is very intimate with us, but we're not with him. So Paul has been apprehended before the foundation of the world. In fact, let's put a pause on that. And let's go to 1 Corinthians um, you go there. 1 Corinthians 1.30, and I'll just quote it. Because there's another Greek word for this apprehend. If you look at the, at the, um, the Strong's 26.38 is the number. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30, in the King James, New King James, it says... Of him are you in Christ Jesus, who has become unto us wisdom, sanctification, and redemption. Is that what it says? Of him. That means God, not you. You didn't put yourself in God when you prayed the prayer. God put you in Christ before the foundation of the world. And it was the Holy Spirit, whatever day you were awakened, opened your eyes to that revelation of Christ in you, the hope of glory. The mystery that Paul talks about in Colossians. Okay? So what happens here is, another word for this apprehend is union. So God put you in union. So what's he saying here is, that I personally, that I may, that I may apprehend, be in union, experience that union, or have my eyes open more to it, it's already happened, that for which Christ Jesus has put me in union. Of God you are in Christ. So here's the two dynamics. God knew Paul, Saul, on the road to Damascus. 
perfectly because of the before the foundation of the world he created him and called him and identified him as such. Now Paul doesn't know this. So all of Paul's life up to the point of Damascus is that God's already apprehended him and he doesn't know it. And now that he knows it on the road to Damascus, and what he tells you here is that now I can apprehend him like I've been apprehended by him. So that I may know him like he knows me. That I can see him in all his glory like he can see me in all my humanity. Does that make sense? That's good. All right. Paul, now, we're trying to understand, Paul, how did you get to the secret of contentment? There's all kinds of things we're going to be looking at that he says that brings him. It just, I don't think it's just one thing. I think it was a, a conglomeration of revelation, or after revelation, after revelation. And when we get to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, the, the notorious thorn in the flesh, and chapter 11 where he goes through all that, and then he goes to chapter 12, we'll learn some stuff there as well. But I, I just want you to see that Paul says, number one, I don't, he doesn't say that I may know Israel's future and when the end times and is there going to be an antichrist is there going to be rapture it's going to be this it's going to be that he does, he does, that's not his aim anymore he's telling you his aim in Philippians chapter 3 he's telling you his aim is that from here on out I press on to know him like he knows me and the more I know him the more content I'm going to be because the truth sets us free. And our truth about who I am, who he is, who I am in him. And when you get, let me just say this, God loves to give you encounters that bring you to a place of awe and adoration because that's when something transformal happens in you that shifts something that brings you to a place you've never been before. And every one of those shifts Every one of those revelations, every one of those encounters transcends you higher and higher into the placement of the Godhead where you are one with Christ in the Godhead. And the stuff you're going to be hearing and seeing like Paul when he went to the third heaven, that none of these things. He says, he is, remember, remember he's chained to a Roman soldier. He might die tomorrow. And he says, I found the secret of contentment. I'm a dead man probably tomorrow. I don't know. But I'm chained to this Roman soldier. I ain't going nowhere. This is my future. And I found the secret of contentment. Jesus, born under Rome occupation, one of the worst times um, uh, Israel was facing the Jews, and yet that didn't bother him. <clears throat> they, were, they were under Rome occupation. There's no freedom. Centurions are in, in the in the streets with their M16s or whatever. Huh? This stopped Jesus from transcending that and being content in the, in, in the, with the Father? Or the Father being content with Him? We have to learn, as Paul, this secret that no matter what's happening in your life, what's happening in the world, what's happening in, my, in none of these things, because we keep getting revelation after revelation that opens our eyes more and more that transcends us beyond these doctrines that are so might. I'm going to tell you something. I, I, I feel sorry for, for the church, for these people, some of them, because they are making everything about deconstruction and making sure that there, there are people that are more concerned about proselyting you from your point of view to theirs. That's their goal. <coughs> to, to prove you're wrong and, and, and I'm right. That's not the goal. Paul says, I'm not here to... Pro he was on, on Mars Hill. He's not there to proselyte them and, and demean them over where they're at with God. The beauty of God is He meets you where you're at. Your theology doesn't have to be right. And you got some, some elder brother who wants to say, yeah, you believe in that? I can't believe Let me show you. You can't believe that. And just downs you where you're at. Now, even if I'm wrong, the Spirit is one leading me into truth. And I don't need your condescending attitude and your deconstructionism. I need the Holy Spirit. Because there's a lot of attitude going on today. A lot of condescending attitudes looking down the noses of their theological degrees at people like you and me, the common man on the street, who's trying to hear the Holy Spirit 
and being led as the Spirit opens our eyes. And then you got these Bible thumpers who are just constantly out there doing what they do, proselyting. And, and it's just like, that's not Paul. Paul says, I'm here to teach Christ and Him crucified, the finished work. I'm here to, to, to unveil Christ in you. That's the mystery, the hope of glory. All right? So when, 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 when the Holy Spirit brings us into these encounters, let me tell you something else. If all we do is inform one another, help one another to better, our, or, better order our concepts of God, then we've failed in the mission. Let me say that again. If all we do is just inform one another with our YouTube videos and our Facebook posts, okay? And if that's all we do is just inform one another to help one another better order our concepts of God, and we've missed it by a while. <clears throat> See, the power of our testimony is not what we know. It's who knows us. And that's what Paul's saying. Galatians 4.9. It's not on there, just... Turn to it in your Bible. Is it? Okay, Galatians 4, 9. But now after you have known God, or rather are known by God, this is just another scripture saying the same thing. Right there. Do you understand that? He's saying, but now after you have known God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you turn again to the weak and beggarly elements to which you yourself begin to be in bondage? So, you know what you can do with that verse? Watch this. But now after you have known God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you're turning to all this extra stuff that no one's going to ever agree on? Why, why turn to eschatology? No one's going to agree with it. We're just going to debate another theory? Or, okay, here we go again. If, we didn't hit, if, if Israel didn't get in 1948, they got hit in 1960, or 1967, and they hit again in 1973, and this is the worst since the Holocaust. Okay, here we go again with the Middle East. We're going to dissect that again? Is that, he says, once, once you've had this encounter, you, why are you moving over to here and engaging in this when that's temporary? That'll change overnight. Everything in this world's temporary. He's eternal. How about focusing on that that doesn't change rather than trying to dissect like the guy? It's Mussolini. Well, that's nice because, you know, he just got assassinated, so... Sucks to be you with that new book. Right? But we do this all the time. John Hagee said, these five blood moons is the greatest book. I watched it on TBN. The best, the best book I've ever written. Whatever happened to that? See, and, and no one puts these people's feet to the fire and says, you were wrong, dude. Why don't you just dial it down a little bit and hey, Here's something, John, Johnny. How about making it about Jesus and get off of this platform you're on that, that all it does is breed contempt and divisiveness. I long to, I, I love it when someone's just unveiling Jesus, making it about Jesus, like Jesus did to those two disciples on the road to Emmaus. Well, make it about him. And you in him, and him in you, and what's he doing through you as you? God is so liberal. That's good. Okay? Yeah. Now watch this. Now that's that one. First, real quick, we've got to hurry up. First Corinthians 118. Okay, what one Corinthians uh, first Corinthians 118 says that the the power of God is the gospel. Okay? It's the gospel. So what's the gospel? Christ and him crucified. That's where the power of God is. When you preach Christ, you're preaching power. When you're preaching the finished work, you're preaching power. All that that entails, who we are in him, I'm going to keep saying it again, and who he is in us is the power of God unto salvation. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God unto salvation. All right, let's move on. So look at 2 Timothy 4.3. Since the gospel is not being preached, but everything else in the Bible is, except the gospel, all the things I've before mentioned. Look what 2 Timothy 4, 3 says. There's going to come a time, which now is, was then, and now is now, when they will know they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. 
So you know what we do? I'm, a, I'm, I'm going to gravitate toward anybody and everyone that teaches, that teaches and preaches Israel. So then we got a click, and we got a camp called Israel. Everybody's about Israel. Then the other one's going to be end times. Well, and Israel can be a part of that end times too. So then everybody, I'm all about end times. So I gravitate toward people, and I listen to preachers that just talk about end times. Right? Or I love this deconstruction stuff because it just keeps getting better. I'm free to do nothing. I'm, I'm just absolutely free to never, ever let the grace of God work in. I don't need the grace of God. You've just preached me out of, out of, out of it all. Okay? Now, don't hear what I'm not saying. I believe there's an aspect of deconstruction that's healthy. But like anything and everything we get our hands on, we milk the damn thing to death. And we over, overdo it. We, oh, we, it's what we do. We're creatures that overdo everything rather than have balance in some stuff. We're always overdoing it. And we always end up hurting people or ourselves in overdoing it. But what I'm saying is that there... How about the sound doctrine is Jesus? The sound doctrine is the finished work. It's not anything else. And out of that identity... You are free, but you're free to be who he raised you to be, which has the nature of Christ and does the will of God. Not free. There's no such thing as a vacuum. That you're free. I'm not, I'm, I don't want the kingdom. And I don't want the world system. I just want my system. That system doesn't exist. There is no vacuum. You're in one or the other. Okay? Okay. Now, the gospel and its unveiling is going to confront, confront our conceptions of God and shake the foundation of all our arguments anyway, and it'll end up taking us beyond our familiar, revealing what eye has not seen or entered into the mind of man. Paul persecuted Christians. Listen to this. It's on your outline. Paul persecuted Christians thinking he was serving God. So we, too, can hold on to our doctrines and persecute one another and with our arguments and principles in the belief that they serve God, not knowing that they really are opposing God and His purpose for our lives and theirs because it's all about knowing Him as He knows us and not about all these other things. Some go so far, as I said earlier, that weaponize these doctrines. And we convince ourselves that we have God figured out. So listen to me. God will not speak comfort to your illusions. We did this thing on transcending months ago where God keeps, keep, keeps by encounter and revelation, just transcending us beyond what we thought and believed at one time. <clears throat> so for you to, to stake out, this is what I believe and this is exactly what it is and you're not going to move off of it, well, what, good, good luck with that because he's not going to speak comfort to that illusion. Because you're never going to figure God out. Paul says not that I have attained it. I'm not there yet. And this man writes two-thirds of the New Testament, goes to the third heaven, sees things he can't come back and speak on, and says still I've not attained it. So we don't, we, we've not attained theology. We've not attained doctrines. What we want to attain is him as he has attained us. That's, that's the aim of life. That's the, aim of, that's the game of the church, if you will. Oh, there's more. Let's close with Isaiah 55. That's clear at the end. I don't got time to get those, hit those other ones. Let the wicked forsake his way. Now, who's the wicked? The lost. It's the prodigals. Okay, they're they're in darkness and they're riotous living. Okay. It's not who they are. He's a son, but he's acting like an idiot and ends up in the pig pen. Let them forsake their way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Because it was the thoughts of the prodigal that led him astray. Let him return to the Lord. Let him go back home. Let him return to the Father, right? And he will have mercy on him. Robe, ring, sandals, celebration, and to our God. For he will abundantly pardon. Now watch this. For my thoughts, and then this, this verse has been deconstructed too, by the way. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. Now here's, here again, 
You're going to deconstruct yourself out of this verse by saying, I'm saved now. I've, I've got Christ. I, 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 my thoughts are His thoughts. My ways are His ways. I hope so. You might have the mind of Christ in some things, but can you guarantee me that you have the mind of Christ on every single thing going on? Why do we have 40,000 different denominations if we have the mind of Christ? Hmm? Now, what, what I believe this to mean, and it's a, it's a safe interpretation, it makes everybody happy, is that keep in mind that the whole Bible is about a prodigal. The first prodigal was Adam and Eve. Then the second prodigal is Israel. And the third prodigal is the Gentiles. And God's <clears throat> going after his children, those in Christ, all before the foundation of the world. Right? Okay. Everything's about a prodigal. When the, when the prodigal son leaves and he's in, in a foreign country, riotous living, is his thoughts his father's thoughts? He's acting wickedly. He's lost. He's lost his mind. Like Adam. Okay? He's lost his mind. And his thoughts are not the father's thoughts on the farm. And his ways are not the father's ways on the farm. So when Jesus shows up, do you think the Pharisees think like Jesus? Do you think the disciples think like Does anybody think like Jesus when he shows up? Does anybody have the thoughts and ways of Jesus when he shows up? Not the disciples. They want to incinerate a town. He says, you don't know what spirit you're of. That's not who I am. Get thee behind me, sit Peter, Satan, Peter. You don't savor the things of God. So their, their, their thoughts aren't like his thoughts, and their ways are not like his ways. Now they will be when, as the Spirit leads and guides them into all truth. That's the purpose of the Spirit, is to lead and guide you into the thoughts and ways of the Lord that your unrenewed mind may not have at this point. Next. That's it. That's it. So John the Baptist says, repent for the kingdom of God. The king and the kingdom is coming, and his ways are not your ways. His thoughts are your thoughts. Your thoughts. What, what's the word repent mean? Not Noah. What? Change. Change. Huh? Change. Change. change the way you think. Okay, so they're going to have to change the way they think because their thoughts are not his thoughts. And they're going to have to change their ways because their ways aren't his ways. But that's what he came to do, is bring himself into them and make his thoughts their thoughts and his ways their ways through union. Through apprehending them. And us apprehending him. This is only part of, I mean, that's why I said we're going to have to go several weeks. for Paul just didn't get this from one angle, from one scripture. It's, it's, it's a, I believe, a conglomeration of revelations that brought him to the place in Philippians where he says, I found the secret of contentment. And so what we're trying to show you every week here is little aspects, little nuggets of how he got to this place because I want to be there. I want to I be at the place of contentment. When you're looking at a world on fire and you can't trust the world and what it's doing and you don't know what tomorrow holds, it's, it's nice to know that he holds you. Isn't it? And that no matter what happens, you're his. You're, you're in him, he's in you, and what a, I mean, you can go to Psalms 91 and, and lay that one down. Because Psalms 91 is, is a perfect psalm for contentment in the midst of a lot of stuff going on. Questions or comments? Now, I don't mean to make anybody mad, I'm just, I'm just trying to locate the church. Because what's happening out there is not bringing contentment. I'm sorry, it's not. It can't. It's not designed to. So why do we do it? Paul gave us the answer, Christ alone. The message is the man. The message is a person. And what he did called finished work. Any, anything? Father, we bless you. We thank you. We're not there yet. I don't understand everything. I'm like Paul. I press on to, to apprehend him as he has apprehended me. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. That's good work. Good work.